I remember as a young Christian when I was really on fire. I'm still on fire. But there was something unusual. There was something unusual about the fire of the Holy Spirit that was working in my life when I was young. And I was wholly dedicated to the Word of God and speaking boldly God's Word to anybody who would listen. I would go door-to-door ministry. I would do street ministry. I would talk on the phone to people. I would go to schools. I'd be in the marketplace. I'd do anything I could. When I came to this country, I did 18 right of entry classes every week. Man, I tell you, I worked myself crazy. I went out to farmers. I went out to little, any little group that would have me just to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. Something burned on the inside of me. The Holy Spirit's work on the inside of me. I'm going to tell you something. Evangelism was and still is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of a person. God wants you to do the work of an evangelist. So in the church, the Holy Spirit makes witnesses out of weaklings. Look at Acts chapter 1. Jesus said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We're going to receive power when the Spirit comes upon us. Power, dunamis, dynamite. You see, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is what brought the Holy Spirit, the indweller of the church and its members. It's the Holy Spirit who remains, not Jesus. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, but I'm going to send you another comforter. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. The church had to be first cleansed by the blood of God before it could be filled with the power of God. It's the same today. You must be first born again before you can be filled with the Spirit of God. So God has you yield your life to Christ. You accept his atonement on the cross. You're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And it makes you a candidate to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was before the ascension of Jesus and before Pentecost that the disciples received the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. But notice that after they received the Holy Spirit, after Pentecost, it was only after Pentecost that they began to speak with authority. Only then did they have power Only then did they begin to prophesy. Only then did they begin to speak in tongues. Only then did they begin to see the works of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in and through them. See, one of the immediate results of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking God's word with boldness. Let me tell you something. I know when people are full of the Holy Spirit because you can't keep quiet. Somebody says something, you say, nope, that's not true. That's the word of, and and the word of God ushers forth from you. You speak truth. You speak it in in loving fashion. We're not going to contest with you, but we're not going to let you just babble idiocy and and, and error and and, and, and vomit all over yourselves and everybody else. We're going to stand up for the truth wherever we're at. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And guess what happened? After this account, we see that 3,000 were added to the church. See, they were told to wait in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them with the ability to speak in other tongues. Then in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, we see that they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak boldly the word of God. I love the fact that when the Holy Spirit comes, he does something. There's always some kind of an action. You speak in tongues, begin to prophesy, begin to speak boldly the word of God. Begin to raise people from the dead. Begin to raise people up from their sick beds and their infirmities, their diseases. The blind see, the deaf hear. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom. There's nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about those this year because this is the year of the Holy Spirit. 
This is the year of the Holy Spirit. This is the year the Holy Spirit wants to move. He wants to have all nine gifts, all nine fruit operating in our lives. Now, the rest of the book of Acts is about how the Mediterranean and parts of Asia, much of Asia, was turned upside down by the preaching of the gospel from these people who had received the Holy Spirit, who had the Holy Spirit upon them. These are the people who had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to consider something. I want you to consider the initial weakness of Christ's disciples. Think about it. Peter, he denied Christ three times. He denied he even knew him. Thomas, my namesake. He doubted all 11 of his brothers, his disciples, had seen Jesus, had seen the piercings in his hand, had seen the piercing in his side. And they said, we saw him. He says, unless I put my finger in his wound and my hand in his side, I don't believe it. I doubt. This is, this is, these are the guys. Tap your neighbor and say, it sounds like you, doesn't it? Just ask him, sounds like you. The disciples, every one of them deserted Jesus in his hour of difficulty. Sometimes I feel like that's the church. I feel like that's us right now. Sometimes I feel like we get so beaten down, so confused by this world, so enamored with this world, so, so caught up in the affairs of this world that we're just, we're afraid, we're, we're ashamed, we're, we're confused. And it's hard sometimes to stand for Jesus. And yet, just like those disciples, once they were filled with the Holy Spirit, this tiny group turned the world upside down. This tiny group of cowards and liars and deserters turned the world upside down. Just tap your neighbor and say, I think he is talking about me today. And let me tell you something. It wasn't because of their words. It wasn't because of their wisdom. It was not because of their own might. It was because the Holy Spirit who filled them and empowered them to speak the word of God with boldness. This is what the Holy Spirit brings. To the glory of God, he brings the power to be witnesses, the power to be bold, the power to stand for truth. In the church, the Holy Spirit also brings fellowship instead of factions. I'm so disturbed at our church, not our church, but the church at large, the factions in the church, fighting each other, jealous of each other. Folks, this has got to stop. And the only thing that can stop it is the move of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit must raise the water level for the whole church, not just a church. Acts 4.32, it says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. God, would you give us that? Would you let, start with this house. Let us be of one heart, of one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to them or that belonging to him was his own but all things were common property to them. Now, I don't know if we're ready for that, but let me tell you something. It doesn't begin with everybody giving everything as common, but it does with everybody doing their part. Giving into the offering, giving into your tithes, caring one for another, sharing with each other, having a liberal heart. You cannot be liberal without the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, the first thing that dries up in a believer is giving. When you're far from the Holy Spirit. The first thing that ignites is you can't help but give when you're full of the Holy Spirit. Because you have such a revelation of how big God is. How much he can provide. And you begin to see the supernatural provision of God. You have to understand that the possibilities of division. Or divisions amongst the disciples was really great. Back then. They were all sinners. And there were many cares of the world to consider. Even the possibility of fighting for position within the ranks of this newly formed religion, Christianity. 
Think about this. This fighting had already begun back in Luke chapter 9 and verse 46 where it says, Then a dispute arose amongst them of which one would be the greatest. It so embarrassed Jesus that he took a towel and he wrapped it around himself and he began to wash their feet. And he says, hey, it's not those of you that are the greatest. It's those of you who become the least will become the greatest. Those who will be the slave or the servant shall become blessed. Jesus showed them that the greatest is, that is esteemed of God is the one who is the most humble, most loving. Where they had fought over who would be the greatest, where they, then they deserted Jesus and they lied about him and they doubted him. Now the Bible says they're of one heart, of one mind, of one soul the power of the Holy Spirit speaking the word of God together in one accord because their devotion to Jesus was more important than their devotion to the world. Their humility was more important than their greatness. Their bond together was more important than all of the possessions they could possess. Their love for one another was more important than their love for themselves. And it was this kind of unity in love and devotion to one another that helped fuel the conversion of the whole world. It wasn't a program. I'll tell you what, I'm so tired of programs. You know, I don't want to have a prayer conference just because it's a program thing. It's not a scheduled revival that changes things. It's not a meeting it's not a lecture series. It's not even great church services. You see, what changed the early church and what will change us is the Holy Spirit. You have to remember something. Every single one of us in this room, myself included, probably me more than all of you, was once far off from Jesus, far off from God, and had no common goal until I became a Christian. And it's because of the cross of Christ that we can ever hope for any unity at all. He paid the price. It is always the work of the Holy Spirit to bring unity among members in a local church. This is so the ministry of outreach to the lost will not be hindered. I want us to work over this fasting time on unifying our hearts in one heart, one accord, one spirit, one voice. I'm going to believe that, I want to believe that by the prayer conference, we will begin to taste and feel and sense a move of the Holy Spirit. If you've been a Christian or if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to be merely a keeper of an aquarium. He wants you to become a fisher of men, a preacher of the gospel. He wants you to be sacrificial in your love, determined in your godliness and, un and, and unfailing in your prayers. Prayer is the place of power. Amen. It really is. Prayer is the place of humility. Prayer is the place of assurance. Prayer is the place where you meet God. Prayer is where you encounter the Holy Spirit. It's where you're empowered. It's where you're humbled. It's where you're filled with His love. In the church, the Holy Spirit also produces growth without gimmicks. Acts 4, 33, it says, And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. I tell you what, we don't need gimmicks. We need great power of the apostles. We need to be giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need abundant grace upon them all. 
grace, not gimmicks. Say that out loud. Say grace, not gimmicks. Well, with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great power was from the Holy Spirit, not man. And we see the results of it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 converts. In Acts chapter 5, verse 14, multitudes of converts. In Acts 4, verses 4 through 5, 5,000 converts. In Acts 6, verse 7, numbers multiplied. Multiplication of the church. Folks, I know more than I know anything that when we're full of the Holy Ghost, it will not be long be multiple services in this house. But we need the move of the Holy Ghost. You can't do this by your flesh. I can't tell you, go out and witness. It'll kill you. This can't be done by the flesh. It's got to be done by the Spirit. Prayer and the power of God produces growth. Not only in the individual, but in the church. I'm calling you to prayer these next 21 days. I'm calling you to fast. I'm calling you to put down social media. Put your phones and your, your computers and social media away. Stop listening to all these voices. Stop being inundated and brainwashed and fall in love again with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Would you do that? It's time now to say for 30 days, let me seek the face of God. They were all in one accord in one place in an upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. Let's wait on the Holy Spirit. Are you tired of gimmicks? I am. Are you tired of gimmicks? I'm tired of all the gimmicks. I'm tired. I'm really tired of the selling of indulgences, the selling of miracles, miracle oils and bath wash and mouthwash. I mean, anything we can sell today to solve a problem in the name of the Lord. No. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they were full of grace. Abundant grace was upon them all. Abundant grace was upon them all. You don't have to earn it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. All the gimmicks on TV and radio. This generation has been lied to, conned into believing the veracity of a product. Gimmicks are thrown our way. Discount programs, promises, appeals, loyalty programs. Gimmicks to get our money. Gimmicks to get us to listen. Gimmicks to get us to join. Gimmicks to get us to believe. And gimmicks to get us to vote. Not so with the church. No more gimmicks. Instead, prayer, sacrifice, and love. And then more prayer, more sacrifice, more love. It's the Lord who gives the increase to the church, not man. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Let me conclude. With your eyes on yourself or with your eyes on your brother's or sister's faults or the problems in the church or whatever, the commissioning of the church to evangelize the world is often ignored because we have our focus on all these other things. And so the church becomes a stale keeper of the status quo rather than a dynamic force of the power of God. I know it's not comfortable to be shaken. And even as the Holy Spirit shook the room that those early disciples were in, but it's necessary. It is necessary for you and I to be shaken. The power of God shakes even the very soul of the Christian so that his feeling can come again and again upon his vessels. When the Bible says they were shaken, I don't think it was just shaken in the room. I think they were shaken in their faith. 
Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But that's to make way for the Holy Spirit. It's a natural consequence of experiencing God. I'm asking you in these next 21 days to beg, beg God for that filling of the Holy Spirit. What do you want to be, filled or comfortable? Are you bold in Christ or are you weak and timid? Are you more willing to endure a faction or to face one another and experience fellowship? Whatever your condition, one thing is for sure. You need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You need his power to give you boldness. You need his love to give you peace and hope. It is grace to show you who Jesus is. And that's my desire for us. This season of fasting, this fellowship, this church is going to be ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have power resident on the inside of you, but you've let it slumber. You let it sleep. Put aside those things that easily beset you. Now is the time. Get hungry for God.